כפי שהיה ברור, אז ארני בא מדמות קונסרבטיבי, אני ראיתי שוב בביו שלו, באינטרנט, שהוא היה יהודי קונסרבטיבי כל החיים שלו, אבל שזה לא במקרה שעכשיו אני אגיד של ה-JDF. אנחנו נשמע עכשיו ממישהו שבא ממסורת אחרת, המסורת הרפורמית, אבל מה שיפה פה בפן הזה, שכל אחד הוא באיזשהו מקום יותר מוכר ויותר גדול מהרקע. כל מי שיושב פה, בא מרקע מסוים, מייק כידוע, הוא באמת יכול להיות שהוא היחיד שזכה לדוקטורט השם כבוד מהתנועה הקונסרבטיבית והאורתודוקסית והרפורמית, ובכל המושבים כולם גם מייצגים, אבל לא רק מיוצגים ומייצגים, כולם יותר גדולים ויותר מורכבים מהרקע שלהם, אז על הרקע הזה אני מתכבד להציג בפניכם את פרופסור דוד שהוא הנגיד של ההיברים קולג' זה לאחר שהוא שירת כנשיא הקולג' בין השנים 2002 ו-2014, מלמד מחשבה יהודית ב-HUC בקתדרה על שם אנה גנסל, הוא נמצא בסגל של HUC מאז 1979, בין ספריו, Tradition and Transition, Orthodoxy, הלכה, and the boundaries of modern Jewish history, and after emancipation, Jewish religious responses to modernity, בבקשה, פרופסור. ערב טוב, uh, אני רוצה להתחיל עם כמה מילים, ואני גם כן צריך להודות קצת. Uh, אני ממש חשבתי שהיה שולחן עגול כאן, ולכן שתהיה שיחה בינינו הלילה, ולכן אני צריך להגיד שלא התכוננתי uh, הרצאה הלילה, ויש לי... Uh, אני מתנצל שלא הבנתי את זה כשהזמנתם אותי uh, להיות כאן, אבל אני קודם כל רוצה להגיד כמה שמח אני להיות כאן. Uh, אבי נון ואני, יוסי סלמון כאן, uh, היינו עמיתים ביחד במכון לימודים מתקדמים כאן באוניברסיטה העברית. היה לי הכבוד להכתיר את נכה uh, אלקטור הכבוד, ה-HEC, ממש לפי דעתי כמה שהוא, כמה מכובד הרגשתי שהוא קיבל את הדוקטורט שלנו ואני מאוד מאוד גאה בזה, אני שמח שאני מאוד על זה. ואני גם כן שמח שעכשיו יש אפילו תוכנית משותפת בין בספר חינוך כאן בגבולות העברית לבין ההיברי קולג' ומייקל קראם לזה מאוד מאוד שמחים על כל העניינים האלה, ולכן אני חושב שיש הרבה קשרים ביני לבין המוסד שלי, מייקל רוזנק, ולכן מכובד אני, כמו שאמרתי מקודם, מאוד מאוד שנמצאת כאן הלילה. אני רוצה להגיד כמה הערות, אפילו אני מקווה שיש לי הזכות הלילה לחשוב קצת בקול רם, כי לקחתי כמה הערות, אולי בזמן שאני חושב, אם אני כן חושב, אני חושב בדרך כלל באנגלית, ולכן אולי עכשיו נהפוך לאנגלית לעברית, אבל נראה, יכול להיות שאני אהיה דו-לשונית על העברית, נראה איך שזה ילך. As you said just a moment ago, לכולנו יש רקע מסוים, הייתי אומר, and I want to begin really with a personal story. אני גודלתי בבית אורתודוקסי, אני לא יודע אם אבי היה אומר, מעלים בקודש ואין לו מדין או לא, אם זה קשור אליי או לא, אבל אני חושב שאני מבין מה זה שיש כמה דברים אידנטיים, ובמיוחד לכל הדיסקשיונות היום, I want to begin with what I'm going to say is, I think, a limitation, maybe even a critique of, to some degree, the approach of Michael Rosenack, and I would include myself in it. Um, virtually every book and article I have written, as one of my children says, I've only really written one article ever. <laughs> there's Jewish tradition, and there's modernity. And there's always a tension between them. Tamid yesh metach, ben ha-mesorat ha-yudit, l'vein ha-olam ha-moderni. And then what I try to do is looking at, and now fill in the name, Svi Hirsch Kalischer, 
Osbio Pilbelsheimer, Shimshon Rafael Hirsch, Abraham Geiger, Zachariah Frankel. How did these people attempt to resolve that tension? That somehow there's tradition here and modernity there. I think for someone who grew up in a home like mine, to know Matia, it's not surprising that I would think about it in that way, and I'm 67 years old. Uh, I think it reflects the world in which I grew up. As a boy, I grew up in the South in the United States in a very small community in Newport News, Virginia, Betach, and Wamaki Rim, and Far it's in the but really Southern Virginia. And in the first few grades, we even had a Torah Masona day school. Uh, one of the things we can thank Rabbi Kotler for in Lakewood Yeshiva. Uh, my family participated fully in the life of the larger world, but simultaneously I was educated uh, in this day school, Yeshiva Katanak Shemitiyama. I, I want to tell one story because I think it reflects why, if we want to talk about Lachanei Hanashim Ayom in North America or in Israel, Lanet Manut and uh, what's the other word? Mechuyavut. But Meazu, this is why I think we have a more difficult problem than already touched on. So I mean, every one of you spoke to it. Benny began, I mean, you say up to my, I think with Rosenzweig and others pointed out why this is so much more difficult today. I remember once when I was probably in the third or fourth grade, we learned the story of uh, Shimon ben Shetach, uh, where he purchased two kana chanor, a chamor, me yishma eli. And I'll never forget our teacher said, because the students protested, you'll remember that when he bought this donkey, there was an Evan Yakara, there was a uh, precious jewel that was in the collar of the donkey, and his students, and the rabbi wanted the hachzir et ha'evan l'balo, to, uh, to the Ishmaelite. And I'll never forget our teacher, and I was really eight or nine years old, said to us, when we came home that night, my father said, what did you learn? And I told him the story. And then I said, you know, Abba, why uh, the students of Rabbi Yishmael, Lama Shein Machu, why did they protest the return of the, uh, of the Evan Yakara to the Ishmaelite? And then I quoted the line, I don't know what I thought of it then, but I did quote it because I said, you know, our teacher taught us, Taos Goy Musar, Ta'ut Goy Mutar, Zelmer, whatever he was like. Here, but that in a, in a business dealing, if a Gentile makes a mistake, you're able to exploit it. It's one of the only times I remember my father saying um, nothing to me about it, but he did get on the phone. He called the rabbi, for whom he had infinite respect, and just said, well, if David learns this again in school, he won't continue. So that lesson came to me. Now I. Relate it now, because here you have a teaching in the tradition that probably most people in this room, I hope, would find problematic from an ethical standpoint. We know that there are universal and particularistic elements of the tradition, and I don't need to get into the whole point about Abhida, Goy, etc. I mean, we can go through all of these things. Or, so, so I had this experience as a boy, but the key point I want to make in all of this is that apropos of what Arnie said, I think my education as a Jew was such that it did not mean my entire life that there were not teachings that perhaps I found problematic. That perhaps I found problematic, but it never occurred to me not to remain a Jew. Maybe not for the same reasons of your Gentile professor, but even when I had theological problems, as a boy too, as a teenager, before we would study text, we had a teacher who made us repeat the words, Arnie's heard me say this before, Reishi kol tzarich ladat shekola Torah kula, bein shebichtav, bein shefal peh, mitnam ekadosh baruchu atzmo, al yedei Moshe Rabbeinu alav ha-shalom b'har sina, yashar l'shanot afinu kotz echad, lo l'hakel, lo l'hachmi. There came a point where I did not, uh, 
intellectually affirm the truth of those words. I didn't think that all of the Torah Shabbat and Torah Shabbat al -Pil. we'll get to the Darim and Akiva in a moment, that all of this came from Moses at Mount Sinai. And so it led me, quite frankly, into a non-halachic, that is to say, the liberal Jewish world. But it never occurred to me not to be Jewish, not to love the state of Israel, not to engage in Jewish learning. None of that changed for me, no matter how I felt theologically. In a sense, if you talk about covenant and commandment, as Michael did, or the tension between tradition and modernity, whatever the tensions were that I felt, my identity as a Jew was so fundamental to who I was, and it remains that way, that I, to ask me, would you choose to be Jewish, would be like asking, you know, how many bocher I mean, do I choose to breathe? I mean, maybe I do, but I'm not really aware of it. It's Mulan that you love, but I've engaged in that. I now want to tell another story, and it actually will relate to Israel. Uh, I was at a wedding recently here. Uh, for a young woman who was a Gioret, but under the Rabbanut. So her Jewishness is completely recognized in the state of Israel. But she fell in love with a Moroccan secular Israeli boy who is a Kohen. The Lachen, therefore, they were not allowed to be married here in Medina Yisrael legally. They got married in New York City, and then there was a ceremony here. Well, I attended the wedding, and I have to confess, I haven't attended many secular weddings in Israel like this. I'm very friendly with the father. When the group came in, suddenly music began to blare, Mamash Pakoran, and the song Eight Days a Week, I love you. I won't try to sing. That I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't want to torture you. Came on, and the groom danced down the aisle, by the way, with his parents. Then the bride's family came. Um, She's walked by her father and mother, who were Americans. I think they didn't quite know what to make of this. They apparently had not been told. Then the groom came, a chatan, got the kala, and they danced together. And then the ceremony took place. The groom sort of kept dancing during the whole ceremony. There were 100, 200 Israelis. Some, I think, listened. Others were kind of talking and eating during the ceremony. Um, though I will say, when the Shabbat Brachot were chanted, everyone sang, Kol Sasson, Mekol Simcha. So here's the issue I want to get to. There are kind of two issues that emerge from this. One, Kanirea, Yehudim Ha'ela, Kan Be'eretz Yisrael, Medina Yisrael, Hei Mamash Meshulabim B'Tarbut. Kshani Omer Shei Meshulabim B'Tarbut, Ani Lo Omer Tarbut Yehudit. They are acculturated, and it's not a Jewish culture. But on the other hand, they are able to sing Kol Sasson Kol Simcha, and an assimilated audience in America would not be able to do that. I'm going to just leave that story for a moment, because I actually don't know what to do with it. I'm still trying. <laughs> Michal's here. I talked about it. I'm still trying to understand it. But I will say the other reason why the wedding was held, the legal wedding in New York, is that, uh, of course, it's because of the monopoly of the Orthodox rabbi here, she wasn't able to be married because he, Gaira Acharei Gil Shalosh. There are several members of her family who found out about this, who were younger, <coughs> and I can promise you they think of Judaism as a completely cruel religion. It is actually a rational reason that contributes in light of what Arnie said to the Nituk between Medina Israel and these people who are <laughs> Jewish blessing in North America. The key point that I want to really make here is that people like Michael Rosenack and I could write about educating for Jewish loyalty and obligation because the reality is we were acculturated into a certain kind of Jewish lifestyle that saw a larger world out here and a Jewish world here. And then the question is, how do you create Ezebin Ezun? How do you create some kind of balance between it? And then how is it you would even give food to some values in the tradition 
over others. I think the problem that we have in the world we confront today, and I'm approaching this now a little differently than Arnie, but I think I'm saying the same things that many of you have said, is that what happens in a post-postmodern world where people don't have single identities, or even two identities, but may have three, four, or five identities. Uh, the reality is you can talk about covenant and commandment in Judaism or Jewish and non-Jewish culture if those are the only two cultures people have. But the problem you have in North America, and I would argue even in Israel after what I saw last night, is you have people who are comfortable with all sorts of identities. By the way, I don't want to make too much about the songs. I mean, I think that's kind of an aesthetic. It's not a norm that I grew up with, and I'm not particularly comfortable with it, but I don't know that it's particularly thoughtful in any kind of way. It's just a norm that I've been told now by other people emerges here. One of my friends is an Orthodox rabbi here, Yeshiva University graduate, told me that when he conducts weddings after it's over, he's often asked by secular Jews here, he might tell Rav before me. And I think what they mean by that is just that he tries to create a ceremony with meaning when he performs it. And it says something that many Israelis, Koshvimal said, Kedilu said, Davar Reformi, below Masorati. So the question really comes to be in a world where people have multiple, five, six, seven identities, and see no reason why one identity cannot coexist with another, how is it then that you're able to educate? For net manut, how can you educate them for Jewish loyalty? I mean, that's, it seems to me, the challenge that we really confront in the 21st century. And in this sense, I think what I want to argue is the thinking of Michael Rosenack and David Ellenson, if I can put myself in his category for one moment. The problem we have is that we tend to think in binary kinds of terms, Jewish, non-Jewish. And it could be that the world is simply larger from that. So I think what I want to say is that Shabayash or Chinuch Yehudi, Mamash Atsum, Vomei Azum, Zeher Beyer Ter Kasha, Mesha Haya Kasha Hayiti Yaled, or Shahaya La Avi Kasha Huishta Deo Lechanei Choti, Afilu Kasha Nigarti, Ba Makom Lo Yehudi Lagamre. We were really a very small minority. And here I want to turn, there's a chip by David C. Hoffman, where he once deals with the question, he was uh, the Rosh Yeshiva of the Wiener Seminar in Berlin, and Rabbi Hoffman asked the question, well, what should Jewish education be? He says, how do we distinguish between religious education on the one hand and simply Limudim, or Wissenschaft, the academic study of Judaism on the other. And he says that the Tachlit, the purpose of Jewish education, is The problem that we have, and this is where Arnie and the statistics he cites from Steve Cohen are so encouraging, and Jack Wertheimer, that basically what we want to educate people to, still in a world with multiple identities, is a question that people will in fact engage in Jewish observance, or that they'll ultimately gain Jewish identity, and by exposing people to certain practices, these things can, uh, can emerge. And let me just, two more quotes and then I'll finish. I think the way we have to start, there's a great shuba that I love, it's my favorite shuba in all of the tradition. It's written by Svihersh Kalischer in the 1860s, and they dealt with the question, it's hard to believe, the civil war is going on in America, Mohammed to Ezrahim, people are killing each other, but what are Jews fighting about? Can a child born to a non-Jewish mother and a Jewish father have a brief new last ceremony? I mean, we know what's important. Uh, there's never any question about it. Some rabbis say yes, some say no, most of them say no, but Rabbi Sneeders Kalish became involved in it. And he says, not only is it Mutar to have a brief ceremony for this little boy, but he says it's a mitzvah. And he says, And I think it really relates exactly to the Yanai story that Benny told at the end about Derek Eretz. That the way you begin 
is by looking to people. And I think what the real challenge for us is, is to understand that tradition is not frozen. Here I think of the Akiba story and the Dari. It demonstrates that there is movement to the tradition and to quote, Chaim David Halevi, Shuaya Rava Rashi, Asparadi, Tel Aviv Yafo. In one of his two votes, he says, Toema o Misha Hoshem Shahalacha hi kafu av, Ainli stopi men a yamin u small, Akraba, Engamishu, Kagamishu Tashalacha. The challenge that we all confront is are we going to be flexible enough to deal with people? Where Michael Rosenak provide the best model for us is that beyond the categories he created, and we've heard this today, he may have been guilty of one thing. He loved Jews too much. He loved the Jewish people. And maybe the way in which all of us have to start if we're going to educate this way is to ask how is it we're going to employ our tradition to embrace persons, and then you begin to engage them, as others here who are educators have said, in what I call a deliberative process. And the question is how do you present multiple sources from the tradition in a way that helps to engage people? We no longer live in a world where we can assume to say, well, why may love Shemisha Yivchor Liyot